Um, so my name is Will Zhang. I'm a quantum computer scientist. I'm here from Rigetti Quantum Computing, which, as you mentioned, is a venture-backed startup in Silicon Valley. We're building hardware and software for a new type of high-performance and supercomputer technology called quantum computing. Now, perhaps some of you were surprised at the theme being quantum this year, because you might still think that quantum computing is 20 years away, or that it has very narrow application. Well, just a week or so ago, back in our backyard, I was speaking to the CEO of a large financial institution. And when we told him that we had prototype quantum processors today, and we had a quantum programming environment that he could start to work with today, he was shocked. He said they understood what the transformative power of quantum computing might be, and they've been looking for a way to get started for years. So I'm here to tell you that quantum, the quantum computing revolution has started. There are people out there today who are building into their R&D budgets the development of quantum computing to ensure the future of their business. This isn't just a theoretical technology. So I think my task is to share a little bit about what quantum computing is and, and what it might do in the probably 10 minutes uh, that I have left. Um, but I've been talking about and working on quantum computing for a long time. So I want to start with a concept that I think is probably much more familiar to all of you which is exponential growth. Exponential growth underlies so much of things that we hear about in Silicon Valley. Growth in users, growth in revenue. It's what venture capital firms rely on to get their returns. It's what companies need to get into new markets. It's also what our economies rely on. We have year over year fixed growth targets. And it's also very famous because of Moore's law in information technology. And one could even argue that the growth of Moore's law with the doubling of processing power every year is what's driven so many advances in different fields. It's going to underlie the platforms of the future, things from artificial intelligence to virtual reality and autonomous cars. But Moore's law isn't continuing the way it has been. We don't have a free lunch forever. I mean, in some ways, this exponential growth is a ridiculous expectation. I saw a recording of a talk recently by uh, Robert Noyce, who's one of the founders of Intel. And back in 1984, he said, that if the aerospace industry had had the same growth over the last 20 years as computing had, then back in the mid 80s, we should have had Boeing, 767, Boeing 767s, which cost $500 and went around the world in 20 minutes on five gallons of gas, right? So I wanna highlight for you how important exponential growth is and how important Moore's law has been, but it's stopping. Even Intel has admitted that to get to the next level, their 10 nanometer transistor scale is going to be delayed and it might even be too expensive for them to even go to it. Their famous TikTok of processor upgrades, they've slowed down the cycle for this. And those of you who have been following computing closely will know that in large data centers, people are looking at special kinds of processors now, not just general purpose ones. Things like GPUs, FPGAs, chips that are specialized for machine learning or artificial intelligence. All of these things are trying to fix by making clever specialized design choices a deep problem, which is that the general progress of computer technology for general purpose computing has slowed down and stopped. And this is a problem because there are so many issues and things we still need to solve that are left on the table. Problems from finance, energy, medicine, to artificial intelligence. And so what if there was a technology out there that could reinvigorate exponential scaling of computing power? And what if it, in fact, could exceed what we had with Moore's Law? That's what's so unique and special about quantum computing. It has this potential at its core. And that's because quantum computing uses a different operating system of reality. That's one way to think about it. Instead of relying on electromagnetics and voltages, it moves to a lower level, a more complex level of quantum physics. So let me give you a slight hint into what that means for processors. It means that every single time you add a quantum bit to a processor, the quantum bit is the analog of a bit, you double the power of that processor. So a quantum processor with 51 qubits is twice as powerful as a processor with 50 qubits. That's impressive. But we've also recently, in the last 15 years, figured out how to make quantum bits on chips in a similar way to how we do normal fabrication. That means normal Moore's law can happen. That means we can also double the number of quantum bits at a regular interval. So each bit doubles the power of the processor, but we can double the number of bits regularly as well. So that's a, think about that for a second. That means quantum computing 
could have a Moore's Law on top of a Moore's Law. We've never had a technology, humanity has never seen a technology that has this kind of scaling potential inside of it. So the first applications for quantum computing are going to be in three major areas. In simulation, machine learning, and optimization. Simulation is huge for high performance computing today. One could argue that it's being able to design airplanes through simulation, getting rid of wind turbines and test flights, that allowed us to go from the Wright brothers to jet travel in 70 years. But we aren't able to do that kind of simulation for every industry. Think about molecules, drugs, catalysts. We can't design those on computers, even though we know the rules of how they operate. And the reason is the problems are just too big. They're too difficult. So I want to pull out one example, because it might still seem to you like simulation of molecules is something that's a very esoteric thing. And I want to let you in on just one particular molecular example, just one molecule, but it's so big that one to two percent of the world's energy is used on just this process. And this process is to make fertilizer. It's called the Haber-Bosch process, a famous German process from uh, 100 years ago. And we still use it today. So what it does is it takes nitrogen out of the atmosphere and it turns it into ammonia, which is the key building block for fertilizer. Now, the catalyst that was found uh, by Haber-Bosch uh, it was found by trying 10,000 different chemicals back around 1910. It turns out uranium also works as a catalyst for this process. Um, but I'm glad we found an iron base, an iron based one instead. So the one we found though, it's pretty energy intensive. It requires 400 atmospheres, excuse me, 400 degrees Celsius and 200 atmospheres of pressure to do this reaction. And we make so much fertilizer to feed a growing planet that that's why one to 2% of the world's energy is used in it. Now, we know we can do better than this catalyst, and we've been trying. We know we can do better because there's bacteria out there that do this process at atmospheric temperature and pressure much more efficiently. We just don't understand how the reaction works. And the reason for that, in many ways, is that we can't simulate and model the system on our computers. Our computers aren't good enough. So that's just one reaction. And there's many like this. So what if we had the ability to take carbon out of the atmosphere in the same way? We know nature can do that. We know nature can make very efficient uh, photosynthetic reactions, much better than our solar cells. But we don't have the computational ability today to model those, to design them, to make them better and scale them up to industrial scale. Quantum computers can do this. It's exactly the things that make those systems complicated, the complicated correlations in mo molecules and materials that give quantum computers their power. I want to let you in on one other secret about those calculations. Simulating molecules is actually doing some of the world's largest optimization problems, so-called exponentially large linear algebra problems. And so the core of what's allowing us on quantum computers to do these simulations and will allow us to do them is also going to allow us to do very transformative things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. <coughs> so in the future, the world's leading organizations, governments, corporations, and research institutions are going to have quantum accelerated supercomputers and data centers that solve problems from detecting cyber threats to designing new molecules, to designing new drugs. Uh, and potentially, as we have more autonomous vehicles and complicated flights, we'll need some kind of quantum, uh, quantum accelerated center to coordinate these nodes. So the firms that figure out how to adopt this technology first are going to be able to exploit it in their area and gain a large advantage by levering its techniques. So let me talk a little bit about where we are today. So today, and actually later today, <laughs> uh, my company, Rigetti Computing, is going to announce a couple interesting things. Uh, the first of these is we're going to announce the world's first superconducting quantum processor fab, fabrication facility. So this means we've learned a lot about how to make these small quantum chips. They're still small. Uh, and we've invested in our own in-house capability to start doubling and scaling them so that we can get on this new quantum Moore's law. The second big piece of news is that we've built our, the first real quantum programming environment, which is a cloud-based environment to interact both with our software development kit in a simulated way and also with some of our first processors. Just to start to learn how to apply this raw power to different business cases in different business areas. So that's the first phase we're in today, actually. Those tools are designed for the organizations that have a long-term view and need the best computing power to start to interact with quantum computing and learn internally how to use it 
for their problems. So that as the processors develop into the second phase, they're ready. So what is this second phase? The second phase has a very interesting uh, term associated with it, which I can thank John Preskill, a professor at Caltech for. Uh, this term is called quantum supremacy. Uh, and, and this means that once we've reached this benchmark, it means that there's some problem that we can solve on a quantum processor, which you can show that no other supercomputer in the planet could ever do, even ones that might be the size of a whole nation. Now, it, this might be for a narrow benchmark, but that first benchmark looks to require processors that are about five to 10 times bigger than the ones that are available today. And so it looks like it's a race between some of us <laughs> in the audience as well, uh, to try and show that first benchmark in the next couple of years. And that marks not the end of a phase, but the beginning of a new phase. And in that phase, we've gone from prototype processors and software development to a type of technology that has a computational resource accessible by nothing else. And we can start to exploit that and turn that into new kinds of business applications. So those who invest in phase one can be best advantaged to leverage what happens in the second phase. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit more about this toolkit that we've released. Really, well, it's not uh, Pacific time, so <laughs> in a few hours. So it's, it's called Forest. Forest is the name for our quantum programming environment that my team and I built. And I want to tell you why it's called that. So those of you who might have heard a little bit about quantum computing, maybe heard about it in the context of being a black box intelligence-funded cybersecurity operation. That's not how to think about quantum computing. Quantum computing is about taking the best that nature offers us and using it to solve meaningful <laughs> problems across food, drug design, health. So Forrest takes that idea of nature and talks about the ecosystem that we need to create. All forests are ecosystems to get this off of the ground. So uh, I'd like to remind you of one more thing. So you probably heard from me uh, that quantum computing has started, that it's begun, and that this will open up a new kind of exponential growth and scaling for technology. But there's something particularly special about exponential growth, which is that whenever it meets some kind of benchmark or target, it almost immediately goes right past it. There's not that much time to react. So if you're a leading, an organization that wants to lead their industry for the next 10 years, and you know that you'll need the best computing power on the planet, then I'd ask you what you are going to do to integrate quantum computing into your strategy. I'd encourage you to think about putting that strategy together today. Thanks.